Hello, my name is Dr. Prashant Deshpande. Welcome to Dr. D's Table Talk. The purpose of this video channel is to provide basic understanding of the common medical conditions and facts based on science. In this video channel, I plan to interview experts in the medical fields and want to cover topics ranging from vaccination to healthy diets and everything else in between. Welcome to another episode of Dr. D's Table Talk. As all of you know that this current pandemic for the last 15 months or so has affected all of us in various ways, emotionally, socially, and economically. Children have been affected significantly. And we'll be focusing today on a timely discussion about psychological consequences of the current pandemic in children. We are very lucky to have a guest with us today, Dr. Nitin Thepar, who is a outpatient psychiatrist with Premier Psychiatry in offices in Orland Park and Chicago Ridge. He's board certified in psychiatry by American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Welcome Dr. Thaper to the program. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Sure. So what are the different effects of this particular pandemic that you have seen over the last 15 months in children uh, at various age groups? So if you could let us know about that. Sure. So, I mean, this pandemic uh, has really impacted the lives of children and families uh, all around the world, right? Mm -hmm. Stress, fear, grief, isolation, and uncertainty um, that's been created by this pandemic has, has affected not only, you know, parents, but also their children. And there's a lot of reasons for this, right? Um, of course, we know there have been changes in schooling, right? right. Uh, there's been isolation, social distancing. Parents may have lost their jobs as well, leading to new financial stressors. Um, children and adolescents have undoubtedly experienced increased mental, emotional, and behavioral health issues uh, due to this pandemic. So uh, there are uh, many factors unique to this pandemic in particular right. uh, that increases its effects on emotional and behavioral health. Um, you know, some of those are just, just general uncertainty, right? How long are these mitigation efforts going to be in place? Are there going to be new variants? Um, there's rapidly changing and conflicting messages, uh, the duration of the crisis, uh, the need for quarantine, the use of face masks, very, things that are very unique to this right. pandemic in particular. Um, yeah. you know, and, and, and obviously some of the families have affected medically as well, correct? Absolutely. We, we all know of families who have been affected medically uh, with, with the current COVID virus that's going on right Absolutely. Now. And, and that perpetuates fear also. And, and of course, if you're personally affected, uh, of course, that, that seriously impacts your life. Right. Have you seen such a thing before? We have had natural calamities in the past. We have had flu epidemics and so on and so forth. So I wonder as to how, what are the different specific factors you are seeing for this particular pandemic that you have not seen before in, in practice uh, with other calamities in the past, natural or man-made calamities, for example? Yeah, I mean, th there's never really been anything quite like this. And, and again, I really would go back to this, this uncertainty um, related to this pandemic. Um, you know, of course, we, we've gone through, um, you know, major events in, in the world, in our country uh, in the past, but um, never with so much mental health awareness. And, and I can't recall a time with, with quite this much uncertainty uh, and confusion. Um, you know, so th there are a lot of contributing factors that make this uh, pandemic unique uh, in particular. Um, you know, so like children and adolescents, they enter these stressful situations um, with something called, you know, biobehavioral reactivity, right? So that's okay. their okay. extent or intensity with which a child responds uh, physiologically, emotionally, and behaviorally to a different range of environmental stimuli. So for example, children who adapt may be more easily to change. They may be able to adjust to say remote learning and, and new daily routines, but children with less flexibility, they can struggle with that change. And so, you know, different people are reacting differently to, to different changes, um, you, know, you know, in this pandemic. Sure. Well, so um, I just want to know as to different levels of mental health professional, and I know you've been busy in your office as well. So what are the di differences between a counselor, a psychologist and psychiatrist and how they help families together to maintain mental health? What are the different differences in the roles that they play in the society? Yeah, so th that's a great question. So uh, counselors and psychologists um, are, are both therapists, right? So 
Um, both a counselor and a psychologist provide psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, a mental health counselor typically has a master's degree from a counseling program, mm -hmm. where a psychologist has a, a doctorate, either a PsyD or a PhD. Right. Um, psychologists typically have an educational background and practical training in, in uh, performing psychological evaluations, and most counselors are not trained in this area. Um, psychologists are usually required to participate in more clinical research than counselors. For example, like completing a dissertation uh, is required in most doctoral programs. Um, counselors, on the other hand, will often gain like one or two years of clinical experience prior to graduating, where psychologists usually acquire uh, three to four uh, clinical experience prior to graduating. There are several similarities between the two. They, they're both mental health practitioners. They can both diagnose and treat mental health conditions. Uh, both can provide psychotherapy. And, and general goal is to help uh, the patients improve their well being. Um, and they can both specialize in particular areas. So there are more similarities than differences, but um, generally, a uh, psychologist, I think it's fair to say, is more rigorous, rigorously trained and oftentimes can be more uh, research focused as well. Sure. And what is the psychiatrist's role in, in this whole uh, uh, mental health uh, area now? Right. So the psychiatrist, another member of the mental health team. Um, so unlike uh, counselors and psychologists or, or a psychotherapist, a psychiatrist, on the other hand, is a, is a physician first who specializes in diagnosing and treating psychiatric conditions, um, oftentimes through medical management. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, important to know that if I'm a parent, um, and we have three different kids, for example, somebody who is in middle school, somebody in high school, and somebody slightly older. How mm -hmm. would they present to you in, in different manifestations? Because everybody's understanding of the situation is different. So what kind of differences you see between uh, school age kids versus older, ki older uh, kids, say, for example, 18 to 25? Sure. So in general or, or uh, pandemic specific? Uh, I think currently related to pandemic specific at this point in time that you're so, seeing. Yeah, and how the, do parents recognize that? Yeah. So you know, there, there uh, of course, are different presentations. So, you know, infants, toddlers, young children, um, they can present one way and older children and adolescents another. Uh, the younger children um, can show regression in skills and developmental milestones. Um, they can have increased problems with fussiness, irritability. Um, starting uh, startling and crying more easily, um, being more difficult to console. Uh, they can have frequent nighttime awakenings. One very common complaint um, is GI related, whether it's constipation or loose stools, uh, complaints of stomach pain without any real um, uh, clear underlying etiology. Um, they can uh, show separation anxiety, being more clingy, withdrawn, or hesitant to explore. You can also see in, in younger kids behavioral issues such as hitting, biting, more frequent or intense uh, tantrums. Uh, bedwetting after their potty train is, is kind of one example of, of regression that we oftentimes see. Um, and they can also demonstrate themes like illness or death uh, during play um, around the time of the pandemic as well. Now, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have, we have seen some family members going through morbidity and mortality related to COVID that has affected children tremendously. Absolutely. And, and I think one thing to, to, you know, kind of that dichotomy between, you know, younger children, infants and older children and adolescents, they can oftentimes um, have similar types of feelings, similar types of symptoms, but it's how they express those, those symptoms and feelings. Um, older children and adolescents tend to demonstrate uh, their symptoms more similarly uh, to adults, right? So they can have changes in mood, like irritability, feelings of hopelessness, rage, conflicts with friends or family. Um, they can have, you know, isolation changes in behavior, like stepping back from personal relationships. So look, if you're ordinarily outgoing teen, shows little interest in texting, video chatting with their friends, for example, right? That's a cause for concern. So loss of interest in activities that your child, um, you know, previously enjoyed is a big thing to watch for. Uh, change in sleep patterns, appetite, memory or concentration. Um, one thing that, that we're seeing quite a bit of is less interest in schoolwork and drop in academic effort, um, right. especially with a lot of the remote learning. And, you know, look, changes in appearance are, are something that can't be understated, such as lack of basic personal hygiene, um, and then, of course, you know, common things that we see increase in risky or reckless behaviors. Um, and of course, you know, thoughts are talking about death or suicide is always uh, the major concern. And, and that's very concerning, correct? If a, if a child or, or, or somebody that you know is talking about some of these things, the best things to seek mental health and professional health as soon as possible, correct? Absolutely. Those, those types of uh, concerns, right? When, when safety is in question, um, you cannot be too careful, can't be too cautious. Sure. And then we know by studies that man is a social animal, right? So 18 to 25, 
age group are the ones who are supposed to be most social. And I think that has affected that tremendously. So how do you advise an 18 year old to a 25 year old uh, patient that comes to you in terms of uh, what they can do currently to cope up with, with the current stress of the pandemic? Right. So, you know, um, that's a difficult thing to answer. Right. And I do think that is very individual. Um, okay. You know, there's so many patients that so much of this, especially in the adolescent age, right. So much of their identity is, um, you know, being, like you said, a social being, right. Being able to be with my friends, being able right. to see my friends on a daily basis, being able to go to school. And so much of that was taken away from them. Um, I will say, you know, coping uh, for the, um, the adolescent uh, is very individual. I, however, I do think that there are many things that a, that a parent can do uh, specifically. So um, to parents, I would say, like, invite your child, talk about how they're feeling. Um, if they're feeling depressed, hopeless, anxious, angry, those are, of course, signs that they could benefit from more support, right? Um, oftentimes, you do see adolescents uh, try to hide their struggles because right. of fear, shame, or, or sense of responsibility. They don't, don't maybe want to burden others. And, and younger children, they may not know how to talk about these feelings, right. but they can show changes in behavior or, or development like we talked about um, right. earlier. Yeah. Right. So, so as you all know, a lot of parents are working from home. So how do you manage this complex home environment right now when, when, when children are home and the parents are home? And hopefully as, the, as, as time goes by and we open up a little bit, things may change a little bit. So how do you manage this, um, especially for parents with uh, younger children who are school-aged kids in terms of different things that they can do and they shouldn't be doing? So, in so look, some what children- are don'ts, to be honest with you. Yeah, so some children or adolescents may just need more time and space to, to right. express their feelings, right? Some may do better with like, gradual conversations and other activities besides talking. Oftentimes we find that, um, you know, different activities like painting or drawing to express themselves or, or manage stress. Others can be more comfortable with those direct conversation and activities that I would encourage parents to have with their children. Uh, they may need, need to talk to a trusted adult and, uh, about how they keep up with social connections safely or these feelings that they have of boredom, loss of their social life, and you know, sometimes even guilt if they've sometimes not been able to keep up with the social distancing or, or some guidelines. I also advise parents, you know, I think it is still important to maintain healthy routines, make sure that you continue to structure the day uh, for your children whenever possible. Sure. So we are hoping that we are seeing a light at the end of the tunnel with vaccination, with hand washing, with mask and social uh, distancing. We hope that the pandemic will end soon. So how do you face this new normal now um, in terms of advising your kids and your patients as to what they should be advising, um, what should they be advised in terms of parents should do for their children to go back to sports and football and hockey and down the roads, uh, graduation party, birthday parties, and more importantly, going back to school in September and October. So I was just wondering if you could comment on this progression that has happened, whereby we probably will be opening up soon. Yeah, so I, I agree with you. I do think there will be a gradual return to normal. Um, right. I, I, not everyone is going to feel psychologically ready to go back to pre-pandemic life. And I do think providers and schools are gonna have to be sensitive to that and, and accommodating. Um, but you know, ultimately, um, I think as more people are vaccinated, I do think that it is important to remember that pre-pandemic uh, way of life. And I, I think that, you know, while there needs to be understanding, there needs to be empathy. Um, I, I do think that eventually things are going to return to normal. Uh, and I encourage any children or adolescents um, to, to make that a, uh, a goal, right? How are we going to get back to how things were uh, prior to all of this? And as you know, this is an important question. And I think the parents ask me this question all the time is that you all know this, and this is uh, something that we all see is that uh, seeking psychiatry help and mental health is becoming very difficult day by day in terms of waiting times, in terms of coverage issues and so on and so forth. Sometimes the waiting time is weeks, uh, more than weeks. So how have you adopted in your practice to take care of this load that you have seen over a period of last 10 to 15 months what changes you have made in your practice and your daily routine, for example, televisits and so on and so forth, and how can we help our parents in a more timely manner? And maybe you can talk for yourself with your practice 
or some of your colleagues have done in this area to help patients and parents more? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, you know, I can only speak specifically to, to, you know, how Premier Psychiatry has handled it. So first and foremost, insurance companies have been great about allowing telehealth visits, right? So that um, has made it more convenient for patients. Most importantly, I think it's made patients feel safe, especially early on in the pandemic, uh, parents and, and of course, uh, the patients, they didn't necessarily have to come into the office if they didn't feel comfortable, right. everything could be done from home, there was limited contact with others. Um, at this point, it, it still allows for that, uh, oftentimes, especially vulnerable, medically vulnerable populations, but also it's become more convenient, right? right. And, and instead of having to, to go drive in traffic, you know, make sure you get there in a timely manner, um, wait in the waiting room, maybe around others, um, that isn't necessarily, uh, hasn't necessarily been the case, right? You're able to get on your phone, get on your computer. Um, oftentimes we're able to uh, call patients as well if they have issues. Uh, of course, you know, video at least is recommended. We do have patients that prefer to come in. Um, in terms of handling uh, the load, so we have hired um, another uh, physician's assistant and as well as a nurse practitioner that we're working with. We've done our best to extend our hours to allow for evening hours as well. Um, I know oftentimes, um, not just patients, all people are having to work more hours during this time to catch up from when they fell behind in the pandemic. So we've tried to offer earlier mornings, later evenings to work around people's work schedule as well. So um, you know, those are just some of the things that we're trying to do to accommodate more patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thipper, uh, for a wonderful uh, discussion about this and a very timely discussion about this. Do you have any concluding remarks for our, our patients and children who are watching this show right now? Well, look, you know, I would say it, it may take years until we fully understand, right, what type of, you know, mental health fallout there is from the pandemic. And I do think now more than ever, there needs to be an increase in access and coverage for mental health services and providers uh, to patients specifically. Um, I would say, you know, this is, we've seen how everybody can be affected um, by a pandemic, right? Um, so I'm hoping that this destigmatizes uh, ment you know, having mental health concerns and patients feel more comfortable reaching out and seeing a psychiatrist and, and realizing that you know, anybody can deal with mental health concerns or, or behavioral issues. And that's something that can be addressed. Sure. And certainly now that the weather is getting a little bit better, reducing screen time significantly, unless it's absolutely needed and going out, going out for a walk in fresh air, go going and playing sports and outdoor activities will certainly benefit mental health. Is that true? Absolutely. You know, I, I recommend getting out, exercising, diet, all of that uh, cannot be understated. All of those can have a huge impact on your mental health. Thank you for your time, Dr. Thipper. Well, right. that concludes another episode of Dr. D's Table Talk. Stay well. Thank you very much.